Group 5 in the building, May 5th, 2022. I know you guys all like festivals, music festivals, and that's what we're here to talk about today, but not specifically music festivals. Uh, a little bit different. My name is Alan Torres, and I'll be talking about La Tomatina. My name is Nayeli Velasquez, and I'll be talking about Carnaval. My name is Ruby Quiroz, and I'll be talking about Dia de los Muertos. My name is Emma Avila, and I'll be talking about Oktoberfest. All right, well, I feel like might as well take it away. Emma, you got something for us? All right, so Oktoberfest, uh, it's no secret that it's the largest beer festival in the world. Uh, it takes place over a two-week period in Munchkin, Germany. And it usually from maybe late September into like the first Sunday of August, right? And how it originally started was it was a celebration of marriage, specifically between a prince and a princess, right? Of sack of okay. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, okay. Um, basically, it was a celebration of marriage between two two royals, right? And they threw this huge parade, and there was lots of partying, and then, you know, it's over, next year rolls around, and the locals of, you know, the town, they're like, hey, why don't we throw it again? And then ever since, they've been throwing the same party for over 200 years, obviously, some changes here and there, of course, right, with the times. Um, about six to seven million people today visit um, Oktoberfest, right? And so, can anybody attend these festivals, or yes. is there an age limit? Yes. Um, the drinking limit in Germany is sixteen, but everyone is welcome at Oktoberfest. A lot of people who live in Germany come with their whole family. Uh, there is like a curfew hour, right, for you know, children in elementary school, right? Because at, you know, towards the nighttime, as the partying intensifies, you know, it gets uncomfortable and it also starts crowding at night. So yeah, usually it's recommended that like elementary school um, kids, like they're usually gone by the time evening rolls around. And, you know, while it does seem like a lot of it is like, oh, it's just a beer festival. Well, yes. Yes, right, but um, it is it is alcohol focused. But. Yeah, right, but I think it's also about uh, partying with like having a good time with people you've met that day, friends that you went with, you know, enjoying good company, all while you know enjoying beer, right, the food and like everything else that Oktoberfest has to offer, right. Speaking of other things it has to offer, there's always like carnival rides and there's live music, dancing, right? A big, there's like a tent culture, which is like basically these huge restaurants uh, where they serve beer and other food, right? There's like music, there's dancing, and let's see. It's an entire, it seems like an entire yeah. celebration, like a. Kind of like a big old party, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it, really from the pictures we have up here, it looks like it looks like Disneyland, you know, <laughs> with a lot of beer. Right? Maybe something connected to the LA County Fair, but right, a little bit. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to draw attention to like what they're wearing. That is a little bit traditional. Um, it's very, uh, I guess, nostalgic, right? Of like um, the older days. Um, and while it's not really required to wear those outfits, um, it is kind of like part of the fun, right? Some people, they're like, oh, well, I didn't wear them, and I kind of regret it because um, I wanted to be included, you know? So while not required, it's like, oh, it's a thing you can do, you Yeah, know? it's just kind of, it's part of the culture, part, yeah, of, the, yeah. part of the festival in itself. Part of the it's fun. Just, yeah, you know, like, might as well dress up for the occasion, right? Right, So right. that's actually pretty cool, to be honest. I wish I could go and just... The rides look fun to me, so right, that's right. really all I'll, I'll be going for, so yeah. Yeah, and um, there is like a precaution, right? Uh, the beer is stronger in Germany, so tread carefully. You heard it here, folks. Be careful, <laughs> right? So yeah, that's pretty cool. I really appreciate you bringing that to the table. So uh, moving on, uh, we have a different festival from Ruby. Uh, you have something for us? Yes, I do. So, um, my festival and my main focus was um, uh, the festival of Dia de los Muertos de Morelia. 
So basically, this festival started around the 17th century um, in the capital of the state of Michoacan called Morelia. So basically, um, as the years went by, um, of course, there was different changes to the festival itself. Like, for example, it wasn't until like the 20th century where um, a lot of people were um, starting to dress up for the specific festival um, that came to, to be um, thanks to the cartoonist Jose Guadalupe Posada um, in the 20th century. Um, he basically got this idea of doing the Katrina and the Katrina is going based off an image from an Azteca goddess um, from the underworld. So basically he kind of combined those ideas and kind of just um, made of the Katrina. So now what people do in Mexico for the Day of the Dead is that they um, wear again those females. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a baby, you know, or an adult. Um, they have their traditional Mexican dresses, um, you know, Females wear their big, beautiful headpieces full of flowers. Whereas the men, um, they tend to usually wear a student tie, t uh, typically black and white. And they, again, um, they paint their faces at school. Whereas um, the females, they also do that, but they also add like different you know, jewelry and different accessories to their face, just because I feel like as a female, they tend to stand out a little bit more than the men. Uh, but going back to what, um, originally um, Dia de los, uh, de los Muertos is about is basically to honor those who are unfortunately have passed away. So again, uh, the Dia de los Muertos is a festival that occurs from the 1st to the um, to midnight up until the 2nd of November. So basically the first what is celebrated are those unfortunately those babies that have passed away uh, which they usually typically call los angelitos so they celebrate that. And whereas the 2nd um, of November is basically celebrating those um, who are older, those adults and maybe those children that are a little bit older and not so much toddlers and um, babies. So um, again, going back to what happens during that day is um, obviously, of course, the festival, instead of happening, it's something that ha occurs all day long. Uh, typically what they do is, I know that I said that they celebrate the first, but usually the first is not very much celebrated as much as the second. So what they do is they tend to celebrate this on the 2nd of November and they, um, in the morning, like maybe towards like, you know, since um, people wake up, um, maybe like 8 in the morning to like around 4 p.m., people just start preparing for the night. They start um, making different traditional foods. They start gathering pictures of those who have unfortunately passed away to go ahead and make um, eventually an altar. So basically, I know I said that the um, whole festival started in Morelia, but from Morelia, uh, since Michoacan has a lot of different islands, they um, moved to the island of Pascaro. From the island of Pascaro, um, people have to travel in small boats and then travel to the island. Once they get to the island around 5 p.m., 6 p.m., that is when uh, people um, take, like I said, all their food, all their um, different ofrendas, what they call them. So ofrendas can be anything, like I said, from food to candles to flowers and specifically marigolds. Um, those are the flowers that they use. Very orange, as you can probably see in the pictures that we have here. Very orange and bright. Um, and again, the candles are kind of just to symbolize their presence. So uh, when they see the candles flickering, then that's when you can tell that the spirits and um, again, people, the people that have passed away are there physically with them. So it's basically, in, in general, this festival is just to honor those who have passed away again. And um, yeah, people just that's love. pretty much the gist of it, right? Yeah, it's just Which the whole is, festival just to honor those who have passed. That's right. That's pretty cool because it's something <laughs> I celebrate myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, not as heavy as, you know, of course, you know, I'm Chokan, but mm -hmm. I'd imagine uh, us here, for the most part, we pretty much... Oh, yeah. We celebrate it as well in some type of way, so very similar. So that is pretty cool. Very, uh, very fun festival. I wish I could attend it someday, but um, unfortunately, the money, the money's just not right. You know? yeah. But yeah, I really, I really would like to see the, you know, yeah. what the tra tradition is all about, and you know, where it really started and all that. So yeah, and you know, that's a great festival right there. I really appreciate that, Ruby. Um, Nayeli, 
I believe you have something for us as well, right? Yes, I do. Um, I'll be talking about Carnaval. When thinking of Brazil, the first thing that comes to my mind is Carnaval. Uh, the word Carnaval in the Latin roots, um, the Portuguese language, means farewell meet. So Carnaval is known for the pre lent party. So this Carnaval is a total duration of five days. And it's basically just letting loose and saying goodbye to me and pleasures. And it's where people have to um, start not eating in the mornings. Just this ties in with um, Catholicism and Christianity. Just um, this Carnival is uh, tied into religious roots. And it was brought about um, Portu Portugal when they were colonizing Brazil. And so how this happened was in the 1650s when um, Portugal and Brazil were, Brazil was still a colony of Portugal. And this came about of African, -Ameri African culture and Brazilian cultures tying into one. The legend behind the samba is that in a market where all the slaves used to meet up, that an old man started playing his drums and people were just getting together, having a good time, and people started dancing to the rhythm and just um, practicing rituals and cultural values that these two Afro-Brazilian cultures came to one. And one of the traditional rituals that they used to perform during this time, in it's called Entrudos, which is when um, individuals from these cultures would make straw dolls and they would dress them up in old clothing and with bells and kind of making them look like jesters and clowns. And this signified that the rich, and at this time there was a lot of social class, social class division and you could tell who were the poor, who were the rich, the kings, the slaves. There was a lot of division between um, in society. So these dolls represented the mannerisms of the rich and the slaves and other individuals of lower class would make fun of these individuals. Um, they would dress them up and then they would burn them publicly in the ground. And that symbolized just equality and just at no matter your social class, like we were all equal. And after this tradition was when the whole dancing began and all the food and cultures. What is known as today in Carnaval to this day. It is known for the music, for the drinking, and for the five days worth of party. Who doesn't like a party? So um, the samba schools are in Brazil is really the main attraction of the carnival. Um, all year long, uh, girls, guys, everybody are competing and trying to get a spot into the festival. The grand winner of this festival wins approximately $36 million or reals, um, which is the Brazilian currency. And so everybody wants to shot at this. It takes preparation all year long. And also the community as a whole tailors to this event. Um, Brazilian summer begins in December and doesn't end until March. A uh, saying, a common saying in Brazil is that the year doesn't start until carnival is over. So um, the store is there, everything closes early in order to practice for these dances and everything. And it's just very typical that like the TV station, which is called um, Global, Global Dance over there, they just broadcast the preparations of everything and tourism is super big in brazil due to this carnival approximately six million people attend these carnivals about two million per day um so the revenue of this event is approximately 782 million reels and 2.5 billion brazilian reels is accommodated throughout this day all these restaurants, hotels, all tailor their prices, they everything goes up during this time. But Carnival is known as the biggest festival in the whole world and Carnival is just a portion of what Carnivals were back then. Um, just everything got transformed based on the feathers that um, they wear. It's actually tied to African traditions. It's meant to let go the feather symbolizing letting go of bad energy, bad vibes, and just rebirthing of the, your new self. That's why, as seen in the pictures above, why there's a lot of feathers. And yeah, one day I would love to attend Carnival and just, it actually passed last week 
and due to COVID, it wasn't able to happen two years ago, but now that COVID is gone, this is the first year that it happened again, and we were all thinking of taking a class trip, but unfortunately, we couldn't go, but... Um, we missed out. Yeah. Crunch the time, but you know what? We lived through it next year. Yeah, we we'll go next year. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's a pretty cool festival, too. I like the whole... The whole name of the festival and all that, the way it kind of started and all that. The word, the, the wording of the festival, the carnival is just like, to me, it's, it's like so brilliant and so smart. I don't know. It's just, it's the little things, you know, the yeah. little things. So, yeah. It's crazy party. <laughs> so, you know, unfortunately, you know, I have a festival as well to talk about, but it's not as interesting as, you know, you know what, what you guys have brought to the table. Um, this one is more of a kind of a wacky one, if I would say so myself. So uh, I'm talking about La Tomatina, which is actually in Buñol, Spain. Um, uh, let me go ahead and get into, uh, I guess, kind of how it started. But before that, actually, it is what it sounds like, just a whole bunch of people throwing tomatoes at each other. So if you're a tomato hater, if you don't like tomatoes on your burger, this is like perfect for you. Uh, personally, I'm not a big fan of tomatoes. I don't mind them, but you know what? We live through it. I'll eat them on my burger if I can. It's no big deal, but you know what? I wouldn't mind throwing tomatoes at a few people, you know, just to have a fun little food fight. But uh, in terms of the origins of, as to how it started, um, pretty much started as a joke. It was not supposed to be something so serious. It just kind of happened out of nowhere. Um, so in 1945 in Spain, there was a parade of the giants and the big heads. And basically there was some young people who, uh, who attended the festival. And it's not entirely confirmed which scenarios was the one that triggered the whole thing, but I have a few of them here that um, could have been the cause for everything. But like I said, since it's not really confirmed as to what actually happened, we really don't know, you know how this whole, whole thing started. But one of the more descriptive uh, scenarios that happened was uh, there were some young people who really wanted to take part in the festival like very badly and there were some musicians on stage who were you know they were doing the thing they were just playing their music and all that and the young people had just hopped on the stage they started dancing and unfortunately ended up one of the musicians had fell and knocked over a vegetable stand which fell into a crowd of people causing people to be you know uh, it caused a big dispute which led into a big food fight of just tomatoes which is kind of funny when you really think about it but uh, that's one scenario that happened. Another one, which is a bit more vague, is teens had kind of took over a fight that was going on and just started throwing tomatoes at each other. Like I said, very vague. Still not sure if this is what happened. And one more scenario that I did find was that tomatoes were thrown at a singer to, you know, just express their discontent. And once again, it's not confirmed. But there is a confirmed aftermath. Um, the following year, someone had actually brought tomatoes to the next... Uh, to the next parade, just to kind of recreate the whole scenario, recreate, you know, everything that happened. And um, they kept doing it for the following years, but then the whole tomato fighting got banned in 1950. But uh, the young people had protested and to express their discontent. In 1957, they hosted like a, bur a burial ceremony. Um, like I said, just to, you know, uh, project their voice and just show that they really wanted the tomato fighting to not like be banned. Um, and later on, the officials saw the high demand for it, and they ended up making La Tomatina a thing. They brought back the whole tomato fighting and just made that its own festival. So in the festival, what happens is, uh, of course, you know, the tomatoes are being thrown at each other, just random, just random people. About 150,000 tomatoes uh, are used. It's rotten tomatoes, not good tomatoes, so of course, we're not really trying to waste food out here. Um, at 10 a.m., they have this uh, greasy pole with a slice of ham on it, and a whole bunch of people try to climb the pole and try to take off the slice of ham. When that slice of ham is taken off, then the water of filled cannons, they fire a truck filled with a whole bunch of tomatoes inside of it and just people on the truck as well. It pulls in and everyone just starts throwing tomatoes at each other. And that's pretty much it. It's an hour long food fight. And obviously you don't want to be fighting for like, you know, a whole day. And uh, on top of that, it's not just a festival of like, you know, throwing tomatoes at each other. It's, it's very, uh, there's also food and like drinks and all that that are offered there, but that is the main focus of the festival. And like I said, it's very, it's a very fun one, a very, uh, very weird one, if I would say so myself, but it's, you know, it's very different and I feel like it's pretty cool. So uh, that's pretty much La Tomatina in a nutshell. Any questions about any other of the festivals that we talked about?
No, but seems like they're all pretty fun, right? Yeah, it's something mm-hmm. very different. Each had their own traditions, their own cultures, and the way that they all started. Of course, for many of them, it was years back. So definitely something different. And hopefully, you know, one day we'll all get to visit these different festivals and get to enjoy them ourselves. Um, you know, try uh Try something else for a change, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely used to like other festivals like Coachella, Rolling Loud, and all that stuff. Yeah. But you know, the when you look at the other ones, you know, across the world, it's pretty cool. You know, like I wish I could attend some of these. Oh, yeah. Too yeah. bad they're you know they're, a little uh, far away. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, one day when the money's right, we'll definitely go ahead and check it out, and we'll be back here and talk about it. Yeah. So stay tuned. Hello, my name is Anthony, and what I'm going to be discussing today is the Sun Cream Festival. Um, there's, there's a story that goes behind it, which it takes place with a Buddhist ancient god, and he makes a deal with a with a kid, a younger kid, who they play actually. As he's a Buddhist god, uh, he challenges a child, uh, which would he would have to lose his head if he loses the challenge. That's why the Sun Crane Festival got so big. This festival takes place between April 13th to April 15th. So this festival lasts up to two days, and the location happens in Southeast Asia. On the first day of the uh, celebrating the Sun Crane Festival, usually what the people would do, clean out temples, schools, markets. It's to help symbolize to prepare for the new year and get uh, good luck for the year. However, during the whole three days of celebrating the Sun Crane Festival, people would also relieve fish into lakes. Uh, it's to help repopulate and make more, uh, more fish for the new year. So what people would do in the Sun Crane Festival, they would usually uh, clean Buddha statues. It helps resemble um, cleaning the city and preparing to have good luck for the rest of the year. It's something that gives the people hope and that they're going to have a great year. So typically what the people would do, they would soak others. Uh, typically elderly use hoses, water guns to soak them. It's a sign of respect and it's showing good faith in the Sun Cream Festival. As a sign of Buddhism and having good luck, usually the people would clean the statues of Buddha. And not only that, they would actually have the young, younger generation of kids. As having the younger generations bathed by the elderly, it's actually a symbol that they're gonna have uh, their blessings in return for the whole family. So what that means by bathing with the water, it's basically to cleanse all the bad luck and to help uh, it more of a hope for good luck for the, the festival. So also on April 13th, the first day of the Sun Cream Festival, typically it's known as the New Year. And what they do is it's called the Song Nemfra. It refers to pouring water on monks, which it, which they do for the remainder of the days. Throughout the city during the Sun Cream Festival, they also put pictures of Buddha up. They all, they're all across the country of the Southeast Asia. This day, this is when the biggest water fights happen. On April 14th, this day is known as the Wan Nail. This day it means celebrating the old New Year's Eve. On April 14th in Southeast Asia, this means that it means to celebrate time with family and friends. So they take the whole day off to spend time with the family and they don't work that day as well. So on April 15th, this is the last day the Song Crane Festival is celebrated. This day is also known as the Wan Pei Wan, uh, which also refers to Bathing Buddha's Day. So on the last day of the Sun Cream Festival, April 15th, there are parties and celebrations that you bring your family and friends to enjoy with. There's ongoing water fights that occur throughout the city, and there's also they sell street vendors that sell food, drinks to, to make the time more enjoyable. And during the festival, they usually have competitions of ancient Thai dresses that were made for the parades. It's what they use to have uh, competitions and show off in the street. So in my opinion, going to the Sun Cream Festival, you would have a good time. And I see myself going in the future as well. Good. Bye. So, yeah. we'll, we'll, see, we'll see y'all later. Group 5 in the building. We out. <laughs>